This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. We talk about inspiration a lot here on Revision Path. So I wanted to ask Jessica Durkin, a product designer at Facebook, what inspires her? So as a designer, I'm really inspired by by people that are posing questions that cause you to think about the world in a different way than you had before. So for instance, why things are the way they are and how they could be better. Yeah, for me, it's people that are posing interesting questions about people and technology. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. This week, Jopwell is looking for a product designer in New York City. Buffer has remote positions available for a customer onboarding and engagement advocate, as well as a marketing engineer. And here at Revision Path, we're looking for a design writer to join our team. We also have job listings from Indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts when there are new positions added to the job board. You'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, just want to remind you again to check out 28 Days of the Web, Now, we've been doing 28 Days of the Web since 2014, and we featured over 100 designers and developers from around the world for each day during Black History Month. This year, we have something really special. We've got a four-part video interview series from some of this year's honorees, and that's thanks to our sponsor, Glitch. Check out the show notes for a link to the first video in the series with Daniel Dixon, a creative director at Vivo. Also, our special 5th anniversary episode is coming up this month, that's on February 26th, and we want you to be a part of it. Send any questions or comments you have about the show or any of the guests to revisionpath at gmail.com, and I'll read and answer them right here on the episode. We might even have a few special guests as well. Check the show notes for a link to our blog post with more information about how you can submit. Make sure that you send us your questions by February 19th. Now let's talk about our sponsors, Glitch, Google Design, MailChimp, and SiteGround. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. If your goal this year is learning how to code, then you're in the right place. Glitch provides you with a platform to easily start creating anything from a simple website to a Slack bot to a web app using Node.js. Get started on making something awesome today at Glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. It's a new year, which means it's a great time to work on your email marketing efforts. So let MailChimp's pre-built marketing automation help you out. Automations work like a second brain for your business, and they can do the heavy lifting for your email marketing efforts so you can focus on what's really important, your business. Sign up at MailChimp.com today for a free account. MailChimp, send better email. SiteGround's hosting services are crafted for professional, business, or enterprise projects. If you need cloud hosting or a dedicated server, SiteGround's got you covered. Are you hosting WordPress or Drupal, Magenta, like for e-commerce or Joomla? They can handle that as well. And with award-winning customer support and amazing uptime, you don't have to worry about hosting issues at all. Get started today by visiting SiteGround.com forward slash revision path and get 60% off on all hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. Now for this week's interview, I'm talking to freelance UX designer Danielle Beecham. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Danny Beecham, and I'm a freelance UX designer. 
I'm also a first year MFA student at Parsons. I'm doing the design and technology program and I design for social impact. Nice. Designing for social impact. I definitely want to want to get into that. I'm curious about Parsons. I believe we've had maybe one or two other people. No, I think we've only had one other person on the show. No, two, two. We've had two people. One is Regine, who has uh, done some work at Parsons. And then the second is Hans Dorsonville. Hans is a, a creative director now at, well, he was at Laird and Partners. I forgot where he is now. But it's funny. I don't know if people, when they think of Parsons, they think of a place where you can learn, I guess, I mean, you can learn, I would assume, fashion design because people think of it from Project Runway. But tell me kind of about the program that you're in. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's funny that you say Project Runway because whenever I tell people I'm at Parsons, they go, oh, how do I know that name? I'm like, well, do you watch Project Runway? <laughs> but our program is really unique. It's on the 12th floor, so we call it D12. And it's a program of a bunch of weird people doing weird things with technology and designing really interesting experiences. Can you talk about some of those weird things? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we focus on a lot of emerging tech. So there's a lot of emphasis on VR. AR, for instance, one of my classmates is into neural technology. So there are devices okay. that actually read your brain waves and read your thoughts via brain waves, and you can convert that into a gaming experience. So what he did was he made this rig that basically allows a servo motor to move a plane left or right. Mm -hmm. And based on your brainwave thoughts, you can control that servo motor to make a ball move through a maze. Wow. <laughs> so it's it's a variety of things. We have a one of my classmates made a eight foot tall robot that uses LED lights and motion sensors and is made from scrap metal. And it's really just whatever people can imagine, we end up making on D12. That is so fascinating. And all of that is happening at Parsons. Why did you decide to, to get into that program? Well, I'd heard a lot of good things about the program. It's studio based. So it's very much about what you want to do. There's structured curriculum, but what you end up making is up to you. And that was really important to me, having already done my undergrad program and kind of taken this very non-traditional route into design. I wanted to make sure that whatever I was learning was going to be flexible with what I was actually interested in doing. I mean, making eight foot robots <laughs> and neural mazes. I mean, that sounds I mean, that's, I mean, it definitely sounds like it's some cutting edge, like next level kind of tech things. But are you also doing design while you're in this program? Yeah, I mean, so. Amidst all of that, the emphasis is on design. I think for me, I think design is the why and the tech is the what. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the neural maze, the why of that design is that he wanted to explore cognition and he wanted to explore the ways that we relate our cognition. So that's why he chose the form of a maze. Okay. I'm interested in sort of your definition or, or how you would see the distinction between design and tech. And the reason I'm asking this is I feel in the five years that I've done Revision Path, people still kind of get tech and design conflated, like they're the same thing. If anything, it feels like tech kind of consumes design. So when someone will say, oh, Revision Path, it's a design podcast, they'll say, no, Revision Path is a tech podcast. And I'm like, no, it's... It's design. It's mostly designers or people will think that I'm a techie when I'm really a designer. Like I've won awards in design. I had a design studio, et cetera. To you, kind of how do you see the difference? I know you, you know, kind of gave that really succinct answer about design is the why tech is the what. But can you kind of give me in, in a broader sense what you feel the distinction is between those two? Yeah, I mean, I'm personally I don't really consider myself a techie either. I consider myself a designer. I don't have a technical background. So sometimes when I see some of these projects that are really cutting edge and really focused on the technology, you know, I start to think about Black Mirror episodes and I start to think about mm. the repercussions of some of the things that we create. And I think when you think about technology as like a standalone thing, when you create technology for technology's sake, you lose 
the human centered aspect. You lose the why you lose the, what does this do down the line? What does this do uh, in six months versus five years versus 10 years? And I think that type of thinking and that type of consideration and framing is what design is essentially motivated by, right? Like Mm -hmm. design is for people. Design is to make something usable. Design is to make sure the thing actually achieves its goal. And it's also to consider what else this thing might do unintentionally, right? Because we often make things that seem cool. You know, I think social media in 2018, 2017 is a, a really good example of how we can make things that are technologically really interesting and really lauded. But down the line, if you don't look at it through the frame of design, it has other repercussions. It sounds like to you, design kind of adds some ethics to what's being built. Like, why are we doing just because we can do it? We have to consider the reasons why we're doing it. Right. I think I think good design should include ethics. Yeah. And I think technology on its own doesn't necessarily have to be ethical, but I think it always should be. And I think that's why design sense is something that all technologists should learn, you know, regardless of whether or not they're an engineer or a UX designer. Now, you just said earlier you kind of come from a non-traditional path into design. Um, I know you started out at San Francisco State University. Tell me kind of what your time was like there. What were you studying? Yeah, when I first went into San Francisco State, I wanted to be a journalist. Okay. Um, And at the time, it was I'm going to date myself. It was 2009. (laughs) Okay. And we were realizing that mass media and communications was changing journalism and that it was being considered a dying profession. So they made all the journalism majors take a minor and my minor was international relations. So after my first year, I decided to do international relations as my major because I found that a lot more interesting. So my original path, my original career trajectory was to go into the UN or the State Department. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so when you left San Francisco State, what kind of work were you doing? Do you feel like that they kind of prepared you for the working world once you got out there? In a way, I think I definitely learned a lot of, I learned a lot of ethics at San Francisco State, <laughs> especially because of the history of that school and, you know, being having the first college of ethnic studies and being so close to a lot of social justice movements in the 70s and 60s. That legacy was really strong in the education. So when I got into the working world, I think I had a much better framework for how the world really was. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of things weren't as shocking to me because I'd already learned about them. But I went into the nonprofit sector right after college. And I worked in that field for a while and realized that, you know, you can't change the world as one person. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one kind of optimistic thing that I had carried on from college that, you know, I was going to go out and do this really altruistic work and make a difference as just Danny Beecham. Well, it sounds like at least that informed you to, to go into design since you mentioned you do what you call a social impact design. Yeah. I mean, that is my passion. I freelance and I work with entrepreneurs and startups and mostly just product work. But for me, what I really love is taking on projects that challenge you to illuminate social injustices. So for instance, one of the projects I was working on this past semester and that I'm going to continue working on is a data visualization project to demystify the history of gentrification in New York. Because I did Mm -hmm. research and I realized that what we consider this phenomenon of displacement and gentrification has actually been happening since the 1600s in New York. And it has still wow. centered on black people throughout history. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> since, 16, since the 1600s? Wow. Yes, I'll tell you how I, I kind of stumbled upon it. I was working on another project where we work in teams as designers and we create interventions in public spaces. So we chose to create our design intervention in Washington Square Park. And before that, we did some research on Washington Square Park to kind of inspire us and inspire the design. And we stumbled across this case study or this place called 
the land of the blacks. I always say it in air quotes because that's what it was called in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. But it was basically a human buffer zone that was created by the Dutch colonists. So back in those days, all of lower Manhattan, I don't know if you're familiar, but lower Manhattan, you know, is, is Manhattan. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And back in those days, it was just marshland and it was uninhabitable. And all of the settlers and the colonists, they actually lived above what's now like 16th street. So what they did, because they were constantly being raided and attacked by native Americans on the other side of the islands in New Jersey and Brooklyn, was they freed some of their slaves and allowed them to live in this area in hopes that they would break the attacks by the Native Americans and be this kind of human buffer zone to keep the white colonists mm. safe. Um, Jeez. Yeah. But what actually ended up happening was that those former slaves were able to cultivate the land and they actually made the land very fertile and profitable. So generations later, a lot of those white colonists were relying on that area and on those black newly freed settlers to feed them. So instead of being slaughtered, they actually kind of made this lemons to lemonade story. And that Mm -hmm. kind of kicked off this whole pattern of black people settling an area, enriching it, bringing culture and bringing profitability to the area and systematically being displaced once it was profitable. Wow. Yeah. I feel like that's starting to happen a little bit in in the neighborhood that I live in here in Atlanta. I live in the the historic West End Mm. and it was part of Atlanta. I mean, it's been around before Atlanta was Atlanta and it's a historically black neighborhood. It's modeled after the West End theater district in London in terms of the way that the streets are laid out. It's supposed to be a grid. Well, it's not a grid anymore, but it's mostly a grid. And what I'm seeing now, you know, for the past two years, I'd say probably even for the past five years, people have have kind of been eyeing the West End. They've been throwing these big like street festivals here so people can walk the streets and look at what the houses are like. And I know that the neighborhood is slowly being gentrified. Like we got a kombucha shop on the way (laughs) and it's like little like small. Right. It's like. (laughs) It's like small little things. And I'm like, you know, I've lived in this neighborhood now for, oh my goodness, about 12, 13 years now. Cause it's right near where the historically black colleges are. It's like right up the street from Morehouse and Spelman, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, what is this going to look like in 10 years? What is this going to look like in 20 years? Cause it's, it's already now to the point where I can see people are starting to be priced out from living here. People are moving into the old homes and, refurbishing them and now they're you know on the market for two hundred thousand dollars or more and we're like in this neighborhood that's ridiculous but it's it's starting to happen so i'm interested to kind of see how that will be like the data that you talked about i'm interested to see how you'll use that in your data visualization project yeah so i have the kind of the first phase of the outline of the project live and i will be sharing that link with you or anyone who's interested once i get my kind of road plan or roadmap for it finished. Okay. Very excited to continue that. It's, it's something that's just kind of, I mean, you, I think you really personified it. It's this bewilderment that you feel. Yeah. All of a sudden you look up and it's like, how did that happen? Right. And my hope is that in doing this, it kind of illuminates some patterns so that people can be more proactive or have a better basis to protect some of the things they've created. Now, I'm interested in knowing kind of when you decided you wanted to go into doing UX, because you said that, you know, when you started at San Francisco State, you wanted to be a journalist. From there, you went into doing international relations. From there, you were working in nonprofit. Now you're in this master's program with design and tech that you just kind of told me about. What was that point where you decided that this is what you wanted to do? I was working at the Institute of International Education. And I was a program coordinator. So I was doing a lot of the social media and outreach for a program called Women Enhancing Technology. And we had funders that were big technology companies, Google, Qualcomm. And as a nonprofit, we didn't really have a good polish kind of outreach strategy. So one of the things that our program director 
tasked me with because I was, you know, the millennial on the team was to create a new website. And I had no idea how to do that. (laughs) You know, the last time I had done anything similar to that was like in MySpace days, copy and pasting HTML into my my MySpace page. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I got on my Google and I just, I think the first thing I Googled was like how to design a website. And I got Mm -hmm. all these links and saw something about UX design. And I said, okay, let me read about this. So from that Google search, it threw me into a lot of really amazing resources, design lab, like early Nielsen articles. And then I went out and picked up Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug, which I still consider like (laughs) one of the best UX books you can read when you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. And over the course of, I don't know, three or four months, I conducted my first user test. I created mock-ups. I created a prototype. And I did the design manual for a second round of user testing. And that whole process just kind of illuminated a lot of things for me. It gave me direction where I didn't really have direction in my career. And I realized that all these skills that had kind of given me trouble in other jobs, asking a lot of questions, well, why do we do it this way? Isn't there a better way for us to do this? You know, isn't there an easier way for us to do this? It was actually something that was really valuable if you were a UX designer. So that inspired me to pursue it. And I started off doing a design boot camp. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The first thing I did was Stanford D schools curriculum. Their free online curriculum, which is amazing. Scott Clemmer, I consider my first design teacher, even though it was online. <laughs> okay. And from there, I did the Springboard Boot Camp. And from there, I just continued to network and meet more senior designers and practice with them and get clients and work on projects and collaborate. And that, that really solidified my choice. And it made me feel very, very at home in the work that I was doing it was mm-hmm. finally fulfilling. And it was finally something that challenged me, but I was always finding new things to be curious about and, you know, having this really great discourse about things that I was passionate about. I'm really glad that you mentioned that you started with a free course. I mean, I think that's really important for people that are listening and wondering, well, how is it that I start learning how to code? Do I need to put down money to go to General Assembly, or do I need to do this with Treehouse? And I feel like now for people that are starting out, there are more ways than ever to figure out how to learn how to design, how to learn how to code. But one thing that I see that always gets overlooked is this wealth of free courses from some of the top universities oh, yeah. in the world. You know, I forget what the what the actual program is called. What was it that you were a part of? Do you remember? Uh, the Stanford D School. Stanford D School. I know there's like one that like aggregates them from a bunch of different schools, like from MIT and Harvard and all this stuff. But it's, I think Stanford D school is a part of it, Okay. but essentially these colleges put out these free courses and a number of different subjects. All you have to do is just sign up with your email Yeah. and the syllabus is there. All of the things that you need to know with the video lessons, like you don't have to spend thousands of dollars to start getting a good quality. Well, I'll say, well, I, I put quality out there, but I, in terms of, institution of higher learning, getting good quality education on yeah. on design and things like that. There's a lot of people overlook that, I feel. No, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, my main motivation for doing it online and free was at the time I was still working full time, you know, and I didn't yeah. have the financial luxury to say, OK, let me jump straight into a four month long boot camp. It really is amazing curriculum. You're learning a lot of fundamentals that you would learn if you were to go into another like higher learning program. I think a lot of the things that I learned online at the D school and through Coursera and through all the other online resources that I found are things that I'm learning in Parsons, right? So now Mm -hmm. I'm in this MFA program and that material is review for me. So it's what you make out of it. I, I know a couple other new designers who, you know, start off really scrappy and they are great designers. So I don't Mm -hmm. think it's necessary to have a super formal education, even though I am getting a formal education. You know, I don't think it's, 
it should be the barrier for anyone starting in the field or at least educating themselves because I find that you know, sometimes you go into a thing thinking it's going to be one way and then you actually start doing it and you start learning about it and you realize it's something completely different. So it's like before you make that investment, I think it's better to find every free resource that you can and, you know, then decide whether or not you want to make that type of investment. So you mentioned that you're, you're freelancing right now. Walk me through a typical day. Like what are you working on from day to day? You know, I have been so consumed <laughs> with my MFA program. It's been a while since I've had a freelance job, but the last one that I was working on was a very early phase product with some social justice organizers. So what I did for them was UX research and early discovery interviews. So typical day in that project was waking up, checking my scheduled interviews, probably similar to your day today. (laughs) (laughs) talking to people, going through my script, recording, recording my notes, re-listening to those notes and aggregating data. I really love Airtable for UX research. Oh, I love Airtable. Yeah. I found that that is one of the most versatile tools that I I can have as a designer in terms of research, for sure. Nice. Um, So recording all that data on Airtable, organizing all my files, you know, maybe doing some mock-ups if I'm at that phase. But mostly with that project, it was talking to people and learning from them, which is something that as a designer, I love, love, love to do. How does your your background that you had working in, in nonprofits help inform your work as a UX designer? Oh, man. Well, you know, everyone likes to talk about being lean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being scrappy. And there's nothing leaner are scrappier than working in nonprofits. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody likes to talk about startups and, oh, you have to wear many hats and it's really fast paced and coming from nonprofits, it's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and they've done that. But also just, especially when you're talking about the startup world, it's really, really helpful to have those kind of soft skills that you develop in nonprofits where you learn what it's like to actually be a team player. Because I think sometimes if you you go straight into like a big corporation and you only have to wear that one hat and, you know, you only have this one kind of siloed scope to your job, it's very hard to branch out and actively pick up slack for your team or actively, you know, plug into other things that aren't in your traditional scope. And coming from nonprofit, that's really second nature to me to check in with the team and say, okay, can I help you with this? You know, do you need some CSS help? I can, <laughs> you know, I have mm-hmm. a very limited range of skills, but, you know, I can do my best. And I, I think that's really important. That's something that everyone should have, designers, engineers, anyone. What are you most excited about at the moment? Is there anything in particular? I'm really excited about my work at Cornell Tech. Oh, yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. So Cornell Tech, it's another school. It's part of Cornell University. It's located on Roosevelt Island in New York, and it's a new campus. But basically, Cornell Tech is just a a campus full of graduate degree seekers. So they have MBAs, they have CS graduate programs, health tech graduate programs. And what they do is they take all these people and they put them on teams and they challenge them to create products in the first semester. and, And in the second semester, you team up and you start a startup. Hmm. So I was on a team first semester and we created a product that was for diabetic patients to help them basically collect data points throughout their day to help them adhere to their treatment. So the product was a chat bot that calls you periodically. It's kind of like talking to Alexa and interviews you and asks you about key moments in your day. How much did you work out? What have you eaten today? What was your blood sugar? And records that on a dashboard. So when you go to your next checkup, instead of trying to recall what happened or, you know, when you were feeling sick or when you were low energy, your doctor can actually see that data and help you create a better treatment plan more proactively. And that was a really awesome project. And it was really great working with my teammates. I was working with two MBAs and two CS majors, interviewed a lot of doctors and a lot of patients and you know, basically made a thing <laughs> mm-hmm. in in five months, which is 
it was really challenging, but I'm really looking forward to this coming semester, which will be a startup. Can you talk about that startup? I can give you the overview. <laughs> okay. That, that works. Okay. Our goal is to help low income people have better access to healthy foods. So okay. we're still, you know, designing the business model and in the early discovery phase, you know, we are out in Harlem talking to people, trying to understand what are some of the motivations when you are pressed for time and you have a limited budget and you have to feed yourself. You know, we're trying to find that wedge where we can fit in and be the better alternative to a McDonald's or a, I don't know, Popeye's. <laughs> what are some of your influences? Is there any, anyone in particular? I don't know that I have a whole lot. I don't have specific people who influence me. I think I have, I have companies and I have organizations that are doing cool work. That influence. Okay. What are, what are some of those? Let's talk about those. I, I really like IDEO's approach. I'm always really inspired when I hear any of their designers talk about their projects. I remember once I went to a talk and this designer was telling us how his team actually sat in a school bus for the duration of their project because they were working on a project for bus drivers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that really immersive human centered design approach is really inspiring to me very inspired by Google design, especially just the, the different things that they're working on. I'm always really impressed by all the different projects that Google comes up with, you know, and how far reaching their product has become and how many different industries they've kind of permeated into. That's really interesting to me as a designer. Yeah. I feel like, especially uh, with them crossing over and doing these kind of smart automation products like Google home and Google Home Mini, et cetera. Now the things that they're working on kind of creating and shaping and designing are both tangible and intangible. Like they're tangible in that they're trying to make sure that they create these these products that can blend into any decor. Mm -hmm. But also it's like, how do you design the voice user interface for something like this where there's no screen? You can only input or you can only really interact with it by talking to it and making sure you're asking it the right questions. Right, right. That is something that you know, I dabbled in a bit with the Cornell project because you want things to feel natural to people. And there's so much that we know and that we've written about GUI design and designing for interfaces and, you know, designing for touch screens. But we really have not even delved into voice design and, and conversation design and, and gesture design. So these are mm -hmm. things that I really am fascinated by. Let's talk about this social impact design. I'm interested to know kind of what it is that you might be doing around it in terms of like, are you creating things? Are you helping out? I think you mentioned you're sort of helping out other nonprofits that are working in that same field as well, right? Yeah, I think, I don't think social impact design is limited to nonprofits, although nonprofits are probably the ones with the biggest focus on social impact. So for me, social impact design is really broad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I feel like my project with de demystifying gentrification, that's part of social impact design to me. You know, that's illuminating a political, economic, social phenomena, you know, and trying to make that into something that's a lot more tangible and trackable, you know, in a pattern. But I think mm -hmm. that social impact design can be anyone noticing a societal problem and trying to create a solution for it. Yeah, I know that designers have been starting to get more interested in, I almost want to call it protest design, because it feels like that's what it's been within the past year or so. And you, you know, we probably all know why that's the case. More people are starting, more designers rather, are starting to get more involved with how they can use their talents in the civic realm, as opposed to how they might have been using them not in the civic realm. You know, I remember... Right around voting, there were so many different little websites and things like that that kept popping up to let people know how they can vote and what they should vote on and what they should know and things like that. It started to, I think, subside a bit, but there's still, I know there's still some folks like uh, like the Designers Guild for Justice, I think that's what they're called, that still is helping out and doing social impact design sort of stuff. Like even if it's just creating flyers 
or creating a simple website for a, like an agency or not an agency, but like a nonprofit or any organization that's helping out along those lines. Starting to see it. I feel like it's coming up more, but it's it's sort of fading a bit. I know right around the beginning of last year, it was heavy. Like you couldn't you can turn around without seeing some project. And now I feel like they're starting to fade out a bit. Yeah, I think people get fatigued. You know, yeah. It's very easy, <laughs> especially with current events as they are now to just kind of feel bombarded and feel like you're overwhelmed or you have a limit to what you can do. And I think that's totally valid because everyone has their limits. But, you know, I, I think there are a thousand million different ways that you can impact change. And I think everyone is in a really unique position to do that in a different way. So I, I really encourage pro bono work, you know, especially for professionals who, you know, maybe don't have the bandwidth to start their own project, <laughs> you know, or launch a thing from the ground up. There are all types of nonprofits, organizers, people who are, you know, doing grassroots work who are on the ground who are in desperate, desperate, desperate need of designers and other technologists, you mm -hmm. know? So just, you know, I don't know, two hours of your time once a week can make a really big difference for an organization. And I think part of the barrier is connecting those two worlds, you know, and finding those organizations that are in need. There's a lot of work to be done with communicating as well, because in the nonprofit sector, the language, the, ideology, the motivation is totally different than in the tech mm -hmm. sector. And it's really hard to narrow down scope. But I think that if you have the desire to, to do that, you know, it's the new year. So if you want to make that your resolution, it's worth it to start the conversation and see where it goes. What do you want to accomplish this year in social design? Do you have anything in particular? You know, I would really like to organize more black technologists to do this type of work. This has been something that's been on my mind for, oh, two years now. And, you know, I have a network. It's continuing to grow. But what I'd really like is to use my knowledge of nonprofits and find projects where people can actually do something meaningful, mm -hmm. you know, and develop these relationships with these organizations that need the help and need the work and do it in a way that's palatable for nonprofits and easy to manage for the people who are volunteering their time. So I don't know what form that's going to take, but I'd, I'd really like to plant the seeds for that in 2018. Nice. Has there been any advice that's really kind of stuck with you over the past few years as you look back over your career? What's been the professional advice that has really kind of rung true for you the most? Oh, man. Well, I always think it's not necessarily professional advice as much as it is life advice. <laughs> But it okay. was given to me in a professional setting. So I used to live in the Bay Area. I live in New York now. But I did a lot of networking when I was out in the Bay. And I was at a gathering of Black women in technology. And we were just having really good fellowship and talking about our journeys. And at the time, I was still really new to design. And I was just feeling really daunted by job searching, you know, and trying to find these jobs at these big companies and feeling that imposter syndrome and, you know, not getting calls back or getting rejection email after rejection email. And I remember one of the women there told me it only takes one yes. And that just, that really resonated with me because I go back to it often, you know, failure is a constant, right? So no matter how much you progress, you're always going to be failing. But I remember it only takes one yes. And that's what keeps me going because in a sea of a thousand no's, all of that becomes totally irrelevant when you get that one yes that you really need. I like that philosophy. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all you need is the first one. Yeah. yeah. All you need is one yes, and the, you know, the yes that really matters. Yeah. What would you like to see more of out of the design community? Is there anything in particular? Have you thought about that? You know, <laughs> I've, given, <laughs> I've given that a lot of thought. You know, as I mentioned, I used to not so much anymore now that I'm so busy with school, but I used to go to a lot of events and, you know, a lot of fireside chats and that type of thing. And the topic of diversity and inclusion was coming up a lot. You know, that was when it was kind of first on the radar and, you know, wired and everybody's writing articles about it. But I noticed this pattern of 
you know, kind of like these cookie cutter boilerplate answers to why are there not more people of color, underrepresented people working at your company. And I would love to see going forward less of the, you know, we hired a diversity and inclusion officer. This is really important to the CEO. Less of that, not to diminish it because it's an important step, but more of the just kind of owning up (laughs) and recognizing that, you know, we've built this culture and either intentionally or unintentionally, we have a really homogenous workforce. And it's going to take a lot more work than us saying and putting out press releases, you know, that we want more people of color to work for us and more underrepresented people. I would love to see more just kind of like reckoning (laughs) with that and less kind of lip service. Because I feel like that, I mean, that extends to tech, but I think in design, it's so crucial to have people who come from different backgrounds on design teams. You know, it's one thing when you are designing for a small product that has small reach, but eventually, you know, if you're successful, that reach will grow. It will start affecting people who were not the original target audience. So it's so important to have folks who know, you know, what it's like to live on a different end of your spectrum, having a say in what's being created. What is the New York City design scene like for you now? I mean, I I really enjoy it. (laughs) It's been really nice for me to be away from Silicon Valley. I think the Alley's design scene has a lot more women in charge, which I really appreciate. You know, not to say that it's like a 50-50 split, but one of the things that I do in New York is I organize with Hexagon UX, which is a um, community of women designers And we organize a lot of events and partner with different companies to put on these events. And so in partnering with these companies and organizing, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of women, you know, at the reins of these really successful products, leader design leadership, doing their things and working with teams of women. And I think that that is so important and, you know, something that Silicon Valley is still really lacking. So that's one thing that I really, really appreciate about New York. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, I mean, you'll be done with school by that time. <laughs> what do you want to work on? What do you see yourself doing? You know, I really like working on the product at the high level. So I see myself in product management or working in service design, hopefully for my own startup, but if not for a company that I'm, I'm really passionate about and that I have a lot of faith in, in terms of them making things that are improving people's lives and not making folks' lives harder. Mm -hmm. Really want to work with a brand or a product that has social responsibility built into their culture. You know, and it's not something that is a second thought that they're trying to scramble to create, you know, when something hits the fan. Yeah. Which feels like, especially on Twitter, especially it feels like (laughs) there are more out there than we thought. (laughs) I wasn't going to say any names. (laughs) It's, uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting time (laughs) in the world right now. And I don't know. I hope there's a five years from now to actually <laughs> actually see happen, but that that would be my goal. And obviously paying nice. off all my student loans. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, Danny, just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? You can check out my portfolio. It's Danielle Beecham, B Double E C H A Amazon Man dot C O. And you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Danny X Beach, B double E C H. I don't always tweet about tech, but I promise I never tweet any Netflix series spoilers. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> well, Danielle Beecham, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing this work that you're doing. I don't know. The Parsons stuff really interested me for some reason. Like <laughs> well, the fact is that you're being able to work with that kind of cutting edge tech stuff is really cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you know, for listeners and for you as well, if you're ever in New York in, what is it, early May, you can see some of the thesis projects that people in my program are working on. It's open to the public. Just Google Parsons DT thesis exhibition and come through. Nice. Yeah. I also think it was great that you were sort of able to tell the story about how you got into design in a very non-traditional sort of way. You know, you've listened to the show before, so you know we've had people that have come up in a very traditional way. They went to an art school, they got an internship, and now they work somewhere. But I think your story also shows that you can get into design from pretty much any field as long as you're able to find a way to apply it to what you're passionate about, which certainly it sounds like that's what you've been able to do and that's what you're continuing to do. And I'm interested to see kind of what is going to come next. So thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thoughts of love are in your mind. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Danielle Beecham and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Danielle and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Glitch, Google Design, MailChimp, and SiteGround. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. Facebook isn't just one product or one type of design problem, though. Their work transforms a number of industries from advertising, news and media, local business, video, and messaging. No other company designs at a massive scale quite like they do. Learn more about Facebook design at facebook.com forward slash design. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. Too many coding tools put up barriers to creativity with a lot of complicated setup and features. And the good thing about Glitch is that they let you get started with no hassle at all. You can start from scratch or you can find a project that you like and remix it to make it your own. So what will you create today? Get started at glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up today for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers, and they support the creative community as well. MailChimp really gives you the marketing tools to be yourself on a bigger stage. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Since 2004, SiteGround has been empowering web professionals and beginners alike to build better, faster, safer websites easily without having to worry about hosting. With different hosting platforms to suit every need, including managed WordPress hosting on all plans, SiteGround will not let you down. Visit SiteGround.com forward slash revision path to get 60% off on all hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, then please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Not only are we featured there for Black History Month, I just found that out, honestly, before I sat down to record. Um, It only takes a minute or two. It really helps the show by bumping us up in the rankings there for Design Podcast. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you're listening to this and you want to hear next week's episode early, then you should become our patron over at Patreon. Now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. For just $5 a month, you can get behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, upcoming articles, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. 